Uh, hi, welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics, Episode 9. Uh, that's a lot of episodes, so that's pretty exciting. All right, the guests today, we've got Joe, because that's good. We like Joe. He's related to me. That's good. We have Michelle. Um, we have Adam Berkeley, who is not quite a panel staple yet. This is his second time on, but he did so well. Even while lying down in the dark and not looking at the camera last time. Um, and uh, we also have our notable human being guest, who once let me sleep on his couch, and that was nice of him, Jordan Bloom, who's the opinions editor of The Daily Caller. And he used to be an associate editor for um, the American Conservative. And he writes a blog that seems really interesting, but has too many big words for me, so I don't read it as often as I should. Thank you for joining me, everybody. Surely. Join me. All right. So many deadpan people. <laughs> a little time. Um, okay. Well, if I drink the coffee, we'll, 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 we'll get this going. All right. I guess we're going to start with Jordan if that really is your name, because there's always been some debate about that. Um, can you tell us about, a couple weeks ago, your piece on on Ben Smith of BuzzFeed and um, can you, the, the, free, this, the freedom conservative, liberty conservative nonsense idea that basically was trying to be opaque about neoconservatism. Can you kind of sum up your article for the people? Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, so Ben Smith wrote this sort of 10,000-foot uh, big think piece about how we're going to talk about right-wingers in a new way. We're going we're gonna to separate them into two groups, the liberty conservatives and the freedom conservatives. And the liberty conservatives are the, you know, the Ron Paul, the Rand Paul types, the people who care more about lost liberty here than spreading it abroad, and the freedom conservatives are the opposite. And as an, you know, an autistic follower of these issues, um, the... At the end of the piece, he credits Michael Goldfarb with coming up with the term freedom conservatives. And that would be the dude in charge of the free that beacon, would be the chairman right? of the Center for American Freedom, the, the 501c4 that runs the, the free beacon. Or the, I'm sorry, the Center for American Freedom, the uh, nonprofit that is above the free beacon, the publication. And uh, so it, that's, it, it suggested to me that this was sort of transparent rebranding. The neocons are not popular anymore, so they don't want to be called neocons. And so I wrote a piece about it, and also, you know, mentioning the, um, the somewhat cozy relationship between BuzzFeed and the Free Beacon themselves. Uh, BuzzFeed is hired from the Free Beacon. Uh, they, ben Smith has had a long relationship with, um, with uh, Goldfarb. They, they've, had, they've had a working relationship for at least, uh, uh, you know, three or four years. According to, uh, so I also looked in, and I think I was the first, I'm the first righty to have, have written about it, but uh, Goldfarb is actually, a, he's literally a foreign agent. Uh, he's, he's in the employ of foreign governments, or at least he was, he may still be, particularly Georgia. Um, that was probably the biggest one. And uh, yeah, so I mentioned that. And, and neocons don't really like, uh, it's sort of the suggestion of dual loyalty that they can't really stand. And usually the sort of, that, the, when that ugly accusation comes up, it's usually with relation to Israel. And I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that, you know, he's some sort of Likudist fifth column. He's literally in the employ of a foreign government. That's a pretty substantially different accusation. I mean, does and, he deny that fact? No, he hasn't denied it. He, he actually said in, his, uh, in the follow-up piece that was running above the fold in the Free Beacon, sort of a character assassination of me. Yeah, he uh, called you an anti-Semite. He um, called me an anti-Semite. And, uh, yeah, so, but, but he admitted in that piece that all my facts were right. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and I have yet to hear another word from him, but I wrote a piece at my blog just uh, just two days ago talking about, and so I had wish I had written a long piece about a month or two ago about Anglican neocons, and I wish I hadn't pulled it. I pulled it for personal reasons, because my family attends one of these breakaway Anglican churches, which happen to be filled, uh, at least in Virginia, with a lot of hawkish people. Mm -hmm. um, I pulled that one, but I wish I hadn't because it would have been a, a good riposte to uh, to the accusation that I'm an anti-Semite. Like I, I hate Christian neocons too. I don't hate them. I just think they're wrong. Um, but so I, I wrote that up, and, and interestingly, um, one of the one of the more um, incriminating, fascinating little points of data 
is uh, a vestryman at the Falls Church, one of these uh, breakaway Anglican uh, congregations in, in northern Virginia. The, uh, a vestryman, which is just, um, the, the, sort of the, the lay body that, that uh, governs the church. Uh, one of the vestrymen is a, is a charter school magnate in D.C. And before that, he was a CEO of an energy company, uh, which bought the electricity grid in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, which is one of Goldfarb's clients. And of course, Matthew Condonetti, the editor of the Free Beacon, if you read his 2010 profile of how awesome Georgia's being under under Saakashvili, he praises uh, Saakashvili's electrification efforts. So it's all a, it's a ridiculous little circle jerk. And so, uh, yeah. I mean, the the aim here with these people is like a lot of people say it's actually to start a new Cold War. Do you think it's actually that direct? Like, they actually want a, a new conflict with Russia for for various reasons? Uh, I think that's a... It, it's sort of a... It, it's a conspiracy of bad assumptions. Not a, um, not a real conspiracy, I guess. Um, it, it, I think the people at the Free Beacon really genuinely and sincerely do think that, you know... Iran is an existential threat to America for some reason. Uh, there, uh, it's not a, it, It's an evil system that doesn't require evil behavior from any of its members, you know. And that's what I've been trying to emphasize to people. Okay. But as as far as as far as wars go, I, I think the what uh, the the reason why my piece inspired the the reaction that it did and, and the strong response from Goldfarb is that they're not used to people hitting back. They really? they uh, you know the neocons have been going after. Uh, I, I think it would be fair to say our people for uh, for years now, and uh, and what they don't like is that someone hit back. And the fact is, if, if if things are going to change in the Republican Party, more people are going to have to start hitting back. Um, I know that your colleague Jamie Weinstein. I was on the HuffPost Live with him once, actually talking about neocons, and he's repeated this since then. But like, he basically says that <laughs> no knows what a neocon is anymore except a thing they don't like. And I feel like that's sort of like a, they have like a bit of a martyr thing going on just because they're not as fashionable as they were a couple of years ago. Exactly. Um, and, and it is poorly applied, but that's a, that's a Weasley way of, of, of getting out, out of actually talking about them and how they really haven't gone anywhere. I mean, Robert Kagan had that cover story in the New Republic just recently about what America still owes the world. And his wife is in the Obama administration. I mean, these people are still there. Mm-hmm. Um, back a little bit to the whole, like, the, the liberty conservative, freedom conservative thing, I, I just, like, laughed at when I first, um, saw, because, like, those, that, that there's, that's not a good way to, 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 to actually differentiate between beliefs. That's, like, it's a, it was a bizarre well, suggestion because it, I mean, you can't tell the like what the hell does, that doesn't mean anything. Like liberty or freedom, these guys support liberty and these guys support freedom. Like yeah, and what really sort of chafed my balls about it is is that uh, I've always been partial to if you're going to pick a concept, liberty or freedom. I've always sort of been partial to freedom, you know, because li liberty is a guy in a powdered wig, freedom <laughs> is a, a guy in a kilt with a claymore, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I've always sort of been partial to freedom as a concept, and to, to have that that tarred with these warmongers that have nothing to do with liberty or freedom was sort of uh, I don't know, I didn't like that. Yeah, I just think it's it seems like a deliberate attempt to be more opaque, mm. um, which well, and, and also and also get get rid of loaded terms that neither side particularly likes to be using. I mean, John Bolton doesn't like to be called a neocon, and he isn't, but you know, for all he's not purposes, no, he's not. Um, He's an but, asshole, but um, that's a different story. Yeah, and uh, to a certain extent, if you're even if you're a hawkish realist, which is technically what he is, um, you know, if you're employed by AEI and, and Fox News, you're what are you going to be saying? You're going to be making <laughs> on assumptions about American power. You're going to be writing things, uh, you know, in that vein. Uh, yeah. I always found it bizarre that AEI is supposedly, you know, one of like the friends of libertarianism. I always thought that. Thought that was completely bizarre um, because they have a lot of really awful, really hawkish people working for them. It seems almost like a litmus test for them. That's weird. Um, opening up discussion about neocons, I guess. Do you guys have some words about this? Well, I was going to say it was, it's kind of it's a conscientious rebranding kind of to get away from neocon because that word you know, itself is kind of tarnished. 
through the neocon legacy of Bush and Cheney and all them. So yeah, I, I wonder why it's kind of tarnished compared. there, buddies. Like, it just pisses me off that they're trying to, you know, like Blackwater yeah. changing their name. Like, if you change your name, suddenly it's going to fix all the things that happened. Right, and it's kind of like, you know, when liberalism wanted to become progressivism, you know. Yeah, progressive progress. sounds so damn positive, right? Right. How could you be so... against progress? I hate that word, too. Right. I'm against progress. But, uh, <laughs> but I actually am most interested in the how many iterations previously that neoconservatism has gone through. Because a lot of these guys have been, you know, in the government since the 70s and 80s. So how long have the, how many iterations of this type of philosophy have we actually seen? It's only come into being because Bush rode that wave of, you know, versus it was, there was the compassionate conservatism, which is its right, right, own right. oxymoron. But then post 9-11, they were able to be like, look, we're the ones who are out there. We're going to put bullets in turbans. That's not my quote. And, uh, you know, and they were able to ride that popularity and that violence, you know, into kind of a, the front seat of American politics. And now that they've been uh, kicked out of the car, uh, it's time to, you know, turn around and put on, a new, put on some new clothes. But I think that's happened before several times. I mean, what... All right, like... I guess I could ask any of you this, but back to Jordan for a second. Like, what, what in brief is a neocon? Like, if if Bolton, for example, doesn't apply, and he's a hell of a hawk. Well, so it, it's an intellectual tradition above all, and and it, it grows out of the sort of Wilsonian internationalist assumptions that America has has a responsibility to right. uh, just. To stand for its values, not just uh, not just its national interests. Stand for, you know, peace and freedom, democracy, and human rights, etc. The entire list of you know UN-approved platitudes. And uh, yeah, I, I'd say that's a pretty good definition. I, John Bolton is do, doesn't fall into that category because he um, he believes in in the national interest. He just has a really hawkish understanding of what that is. I don't. I mean. Acting as if there's some sort of scientific way to tell who qualifies as a, as a neocon or anything else is sort of silly as well. well right. I mean, I and then the other thing, the other thing that, that it must be said is that neoconservatism is very much a family affair. Um, yeah. The, the, the free beacon is, uh, the editor-in-chief is, is Bill Crystal's son-in-law. These, um, you know, and John, John Podoretz, he's, uh, you know, the son of Norm Podoretz and, and still, you know, he's a you know, hawkish columnist. It's a it's a very small group of people, you know, Robert Kagan, Victoria Newland, etc. There really aren't very many of these people. Hmm. Jordan, you don't mean to say that there's dynastic politics going on in America, do you? <laughs> uh, that might be one way of putting it. But I'm, I mean, you can trace the decline of of neoconservatism as an intellectual movement. And I'm not opposed to neoconservatism by any means. Uh, I think it's done a lot of good things, like Daniel Bell. I think the, the injection of social science into the right. Is, is very much the neocons' inheritance. Uh, you know, you, you see people bringing in social science to the conservative movement. Uh, you know, how, we, how can we trim the welfare state rather than just treating it as something that needs to be abolished as like a moral evil? Uh, you know, the, the old right was characterized by an emphasis on literature and, uh, you know, the intellectual tradition as opposed to the neocons come in and they've got the social science. And uh, I think a lot of that legacy is really good. It lives on in a AEI, but uh, mm. as far as the foreign policy goes, I don't think that's as good. And it's not yeah. like the neocons have any, like, I mean, they're not the only ones pushing the U.S. into foreign conflicts and war. I mean, basically sure. since, since Wilson, you know, pretty much. Well, I mean, it, when you get neocon as shorthand for interventionist, maybe you do get a bit muddy, but... Or shorthand for Jew, and that's sort of a, that's also really dodgy territory. Well, yeah. I, it is true that in the world, that, there are the anti-Semitic boogeyman that, men that um, you were recently accused of being. You just, you know, aren't one as far as I know. And neither am I, and neither are most people that I uh, talk to for more than four minutes. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't, I don't know enough of the um, uh, of the history of, of, of the right as an intellectual movement to uh, speak on this, and I guess I'll just keep on pissing off Jamie Weinstein and uh, equating interventionism with uh, neoconservatism. Yeah, and I think <laughs> the, the point I was driving at is that, um, you know, neoconservatism used to be a very intellectually robust thing, and 
to, we've gone from Irving Crystal to Bill Crystal to Matt Continetti. And, so that's uh, a decline? I, I would say that that's a decline. Hmm. I mean, in my, from my understanding, the whole weird Trotskyite um, influence in the neocons as well. I mean... Yeah, I love bringing that up. That, that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, does that... Yeah. I mean, so, do they so really Irving admit Crystal's that? Is what? Do they, I mean, do, do they talk about that as an influence? Anymore? No, not really. But I mean, if you're talking about a, a global permanent democratic revolution regime, you know, that's that's Trotskyism. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. they've, uh, they've, they've brought it into the house. And uh, but shit, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, I mean, in some ways, neoconservatism is to me it's 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 the type of conservatism that is less hypocritical in that they don't pretend to be for a small government on any type of principle and um and well like with the welfare state you said like they don't talk about getting rid of it because this is america and, and bootstraps and stuff in some ways they they admit that they you know we need some sort of 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 robust state and as long as it has certain principles um you know the state has certain principles behind it then then the, the size of it doesn't really matter is that does that go with your thinking on neocons? Yeah, I think more or less. Um, yeah. And, and uh, to, to follow up on the on the Trotskyite thing, there are actually so in in the piece I wrote in my blog about these about these Anglican uh, neocons, uh, it, one of the interesting overlaps is between the Institute on Religion and Democracy. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It was basically founded to be a sort of right wing counterweight to the World Council of Churches, and the World Council of Churches is a set of uh, Mainline Protestant denominations is pretty thoroughly leftist. Mm. Like they had, uh, they had one of their conferences in the late '90s in Harare uh, under Mugabe. They've been big Mugabe boosters, and uh, and so this was founded to be sort of a counterweight to that. And the IRD actually grew out of the Scoop Jackson wing of the Democratic Party, and uh, one of the founders was David Jessup, who is a founder of Social Democrats uh, USA. Or uh, and then uh, what else? So he would like he was a Shockmanite, which is sort of this Trotskyite sect out of New York City. And, uh, you know, so the IRD is now seen as sort of this conservative movement standard bearer for making, uh, you know, reinstilling conservative values in mostly American Protestantism. Mm. Uh, but, again, there a lot of, in, in the mid-2000s, they were telling churches to shut up about the Iraq War. And, uh, you know, so I think there really needs to be, um, a, the conservative movement needs to come to terms with, with what it's going to stand for in War and Peace. Hopefully, uh, a little more on the peace side. That would be ideal. <laughs> but I'm not going to hold my breath about that. Because not even libertarians can get that one right. And no offense to Jordan, but I expect slightly more from libertarians than uh, from the right. And they still fail. So, I don't know. I'm cranky about war lately, guys. I'm cranky about Israel. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I feel like... Hmm. We could just move on to a new topic, Joe. Be decisive about that. Let's be decisive. Yes, let's move on, Lisa. Um, so, I don't know, a couple days ago there was a National Review piece about, by A.J. Delgado, I think, about how conservatives, because I guess that's kind of our topic a bit for the day, um, conservatives need to stop excusing the police. Um, and Bill Maher, who I despise, but I like to hate watch with my father quite often, did a little uh, monologue on his last show where he talked, you know, it, it was like the, the, the facts of it were, were totally fine, talking about, you know, problems with the American police and stuff. Like, it was a good general summation of the issue. But he also said, of course, like, why isn't the Tea Party mad about this? And basically you know, in, in implied that this was some sort of liberal cause, and, 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 and I don't want to be one of those, like, commenters who's like, well, this is nothing new, why are you saying this? But it was, he wasn't giving due credit to the kind of people who have been talking about this for probably a lot longer than he has. Um, I don't know, I, I think that, in my experience, uh, the police thing is starting to become a, dare I say it, bipartisan or, like, tripartisan issue. Um, which is good, but I don't know. What do you do? You guys do you guys think that there's any truth to the fact that perhaps in the past um, 
you know, hippies getting beaten up by police and uh, and such. This was more true. But I think lately, um, this criticism isn't as actually relevant as it might have been a couple, you know, decades ago. Um, yeah. Words? <laughs> I mean, I think... Like, from a technical perspective, I think we can see that police tactics are definitely getting more and more military. That's pretty obvious. And certainly the equipment is getting more military. And there's only so many times that you can shoot people through doors and toss flashbangs into cribs before it becomes a human problem and not an ideological issue. I mean, that's sort of optimistic, unfortunately. Well, I and think, I you know, it's. I feel like this, I feel like this, you, you, you ask, is the is it becoming, uh, you know, an obsolete criticism? I think it's, it is to some degree. I think there's more and more awareness because you see more and more, I mean, this, there's been a there's now second video of, uh, you know, illegal chokeholds being used in New York. Now, it shouldn't surprise anyone that people are, uh, that cops in New York are using chokeholds. Uh, I spe you know, I live most of the time in New York City. It's not the greatest police force, but... Uh, you know, I, I think that there. You know, it's we're getting to the point where it's it's not easy for certain people to dismiss those people as being black or drug addicts or, you know, d uh, deranged in some way. We're starting to see situations. There was a situation in Seattle where the gentleman was held down by three transit officers, then shot by a sheriff. Um, you know, and I think we're starting to see that it's just it's becoming more of a human problem and less of an ideological problem. But of course, those things always take time because we need to we need to uh, support the boys in blue. They do take time, and that's that's the horrible thing is that I mean, it's true. Like they, it's harder to dismiss the problem when it it comes to the door of you know the mayor of a suburb in um, Maryland, I guess that uh, Shea Calvo guy a couple of years ago. Well, it's it's a lot I harder. I think there is some truth. Sorry, Joe? I was going to say, you know, it's a lot harder with, you know, the proliferation of, you know, cell phones with video cameras and the internet, you know, blogging and all these different sites. You know, the police can't really get away with what they used to be able to get away with. There's more witnesses. They can get uh, away with it. We just know it's happening, definitely. Well, I mean, you don't know how much it happened in the past, though. There's no, mm -hmm. you know, there's not the record that there is now, mm -hmm. you know. People can take pictures. People can, you know, surreptitiously take cell phone videos, and I think there is kind of, you know, a movement growing, even on the right. You know, Charles C. W. Cook had a good piece about the same thing in mm -hmm. National Review. Yeah. And you know, I think it's being forced into the spotlight, and you know, people are actually having to deal with it now instead of just kind of, you know, poo-pooing the fact. Oh no, you know, those are isolated incidents. Mm, isolated incidents. Yes. The. Uh... The running Radley Balco joke about uh, the same story being repeated scores of times. What one thing though that comes to my mind is the whole in the '90s um, criticizing. I mean, the critiques were most mostly directed at federal law enforcement. I think um, in the '90s, you know, you have your Ruby Ridge and your Waco scenarios, um, and there was definitely a certain amount of liberal excuses for for these incidents and just for feds, you know, they don't like the, and there's still some of that today, like Rachel Maddow can still do a little screed about the horror of the time someone from the NRA called um, the ATF jackbooted thugs, and I, you know, never liked the NRA better than when I heard that. So I fear that there is still an element of the partisan switching back and forth, depending Depending on who is president um, and what kind of fears are in fashion. <laughs> I, actually, one of the things that brings up the point, so in those types of incidents, those previous incidents, um, you typically get like the SWAT teams from the federal SWAT teams. But they've been so busy in Afghanistan, I actually feel like this may have kept uh, them away from some of these incidents in the United States. They've been so busy running around with the Tier 1 units in Afghanistan that we haven't had a lot of these guys, like the HRT guys, uh, in America for a long time. It's and then it's only like recently that they've actually been operating in the states again. And uh, I think it's it's worth pointing out that not all cops are created equal. You've got the um, like in New York, uh, the sheriff's departments of most of the counties in New York are are defying the Safe Act, refusing to enforce it, mm -hmm. and things like that. So to some extent, making the case for criminal justice reform to the conservatives is going to entail 
you should support these cops because you can control them better and they're closer to your interests and they speak for your interests better than, say, a state police department or um, something like that. That's still, that's still going to maybe end in a sort of partisanal divide, though. I mean, there's... I, uh, liberals, I think it, it might be fair to say that in general, liberals have been more down on local police departments and conservatives have been more down on um, federal law enforcement. And there's still an element of that. Um, and I suppose in theory, you know, the federal, the federal law enforcement is worse and can do more damage. Um, but the real danger is, of course, the fact that they're very tied together. Um, and there are a lot, there's a whole incentive structure to tie them together. And something like asset forfeiture, as long as you have, you know, one DEA guy uh, in your drug bust, then you, you, you get the whole, the federal um, asset forfeiture law kicks in, and you, you tend to have a sweet pot of federal money to uh, fund your uh, new police, um, you know, tank or equivalent. No. This, the, uh, just to bring up the sweet pots of federal money, um, it might be slightly off topic, but the uh, the cell phone tracking uh, systems. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. The heard stingrays. Of this. Yeah, with the the federal grants, they mm -hmm. give you the money, you give it back to them. We give you the stingray. Here you go. Um, I think that's an interesting thing. I actually think a lot of these issues. I mean, they've always existed, but they've become exacerbated by the massive amount of money. Uh, that came out of Washington post 9/11. I mean, I, I'm in I'm in Fairfax County now. I lived in Loudoun County, Virginia, and the policing is just the equipment is ridiculous. But the the general attitude of the police has always interested me. Is and they they have this sort of sense that they're protecting something greater than their county, and uh, and I think generally across the board, there's been an, I think we might be starting to see. Uh, just because of budget crunches, less less money for police departments. But I think post 9/11 there was a huge influx of government money for uh, national security, and I feel like that's affected this to some degree. Also, the um, I remember um, I've met a few veterans, like Iraq veterans, that had come back, and that's a job that they frequently are able to get. Uh, police departments certainly love veterans, and uh, that was an issue in Loudoun County for a time in which. Uh, Traffic stops became almost like uh, you know car searches at green zone checkpoints, and uh, there were several incidents of like uh, older women or uh, pregnant women being slammed against the hoods of their cars and things because these veterans had been improperly counseled or not counseled at all, and then given a gun and a badge and told to enforce the laws. Uh, so there was definitely some aggression issues out here, and I wonder sometimes not to you know stain veterans by any. Stretch, but I do wonder sometimes if it's if it's necessarily appropriate for these people to go from policing one street to another street. Uh, just a thought. Well, oddly enough, I've heard a couple of, um, uh, admittedly anecdotal, but uh, I read and heard a couple of um, people say that over in Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot people who were on police forces and then became soldiers over there were often. They were the ones where other soldiers were like, what the fuck is this yeah. going to happen to? Like, I've heard that as well. Down, buddy. I've heard that as well, yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, that is hilarious in a very dark way. Not that I really want foreign people treated, um, you know, badly either, but it, it doesn't bode well for us, certainly, and perhaps it's uh, some sort of twisted collective justice, but no, it's not. I mean, I don't have quite the hatred, I guess, of police that you do, Lacey. Um, I would <laughs> go on, Joe. Go but, on. But um, you know, a lot of it, I feel like, is tied up in the amount of laws there are and the bad laws there are. I mean, that can't be ignored when you're talking about you know these police, you know, incidents. You know, there's so many bad laws that allow police to do this kind of thing. You can't just you know let them run free and make you know make all the legislature. You know, there has to be there has to be better laws and more precise laws about, you know, these kind of things, you know, all this, you know, searching of people's cars for no reason, you know, on a police stop, you know, stuff like that has to be eliminated. And I feel like you will see less kind of police incidences of brutality. Um, to, I mean, that's true. That's part of the problem. I just don't think that that excuses the behavior of cops. I mean, it doesn't excuse it. I just feel like... It's something that doesn't get brought up enough when we're it's talking true. about yeah. 
there's this strange thing I've noticed with um, some of the people I talk to who are, you know, passionate about criminal justice issues, um, where they're almost, you know, reluctant to um, talk about these issues, um, like botched raids and whatever, um, because they fear being lumped into um, this category of, you know, being some Bundy extremist, you know, like if they say anything bad about cops or um, law enforcement that they should belong on a Bundy ranch or whatever. And uh, it's just, it's just really interesting that I've, ex I don't know, just in talking to people that that's kind of their mindset. Like, yeah, yeah, I agree. Those things are definitely, you know, there are a lot of things wrong, but um, I don't want to be lumped in with the type of people they think usually comment on those issues. Those people need to man up, but yeah, yeah I mean, that's, I think it's becoming more mainstream if you browse the comments on, you know, any police brutality story. In my experience, at least in the past, you know, two or three years, you're going to get at least half probably more people who are actually saying, what the hell, police officers. I get a lot of vice people who were, I think, trying to troll me and are actually uh, taking issue with the things I write about cops for vice, but... Um, Generally speaking, it is becoming more mainstream, and that's good. I just... I, I think there was a wave yeah. of patriotism. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, I was just going to say, if we're going to bring up the Clive and Bundy thing, I think this is really interesting. There's, uh, <laughs> there's that county in southern Oregon that, that uh, its subsidies were cut for its public land, and they, uh, they were going to have to raise taxes or cut their sheriff's department. And they voted not to raise their taxes, and, and uh, instead have just put together a sort of a uh, 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 citizen's patrol, and, and that's their, effectively, their, their, uh, their police department for now. And, and I think that may be the, uh, you know, how things start to look in the future. And then, uh, back to Clive and Bundy, I think they, uh, th these land use issues really are going to be the place where these sort of patriot, oath keeper type people are, these conflicts are going to get more and more intense, I think. Um, especially over land use, and and it will be if there's anything I, I've I've talked to a Naderite friend of mine about this, and we were just sort of you know shooting the shit, um, you know, asking what would be the thing that would cause large scale civil strife and violence to break out in in America, and and we uh, we decided he suggested, and I agreed that it would probably be environmental um, le legislation that would impose greater control over uh, you know natural resources out west, and people just say no states and municipalities start pushing back, like Clive and Bundy on a whole other level. And uh, I don't know, I think that's a, um, that's sort of an interesting way of framing how these uh, Oath Keeper police versus not police um, debates are going to go down. Yeah, that's a whole, that's like a tangent, but it's one that intrigues me. Um, yeah. I, I do think that, I, I think that to say something half ass nice about law Enforcement. I do think that even though nobody was punished for Waco, and that was, um, your words can't describe how ridiculously terrible that was, I think the shadow of that actually does um, make federal law enforcement um, ease back a bit. It's weird because you have this increase in, you know, individual SWAT raids on private homes, but at the same time, when it comes to sort of a potential classic standoff thing, I think that they're actually afraid of another Waco, especially in the era of everyone with cameras. Right. And that has given them... Clive and Bundy's ranch. Uh, yeah, definitely. They're, they're sort of a, they seem to have taken a let those hayseeds have their protest, we'll restore law and order when they leave uh, sort of attitude. And you got you, you get the liberals who were a little too, maybe not blood like bloodthirsty, but they were like, you know, they were carrying guns around law enforcement. Why didn't you round them all up and, you know, it's shoot them? The, <laughs> and it's the same, it's the 90s thing all over again. I think you still have, and you still have conservatives thinking, damn hippies deserved it when somebody gets beaten, you know, Occupy so-and-so gets beaten by the NYPD. There is still this element of picking your favorite people and picking your favorite law enforcement and assuming that ill intentions on the uh, other side of this, these types of conflicts. So it's getting better, but there's still this partisan thing, I think. I'm sure Waco affected the rules of engagement for federal law enforcement. Just Even just from the bad publicity standpoint. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, I mean, as bad as they can be, I'm sure that affected it. It just, I mean, that's I, the thing. Things can change slightly, but we're still not at the point where people get consequences for these actions. 
Like I'm sorry, if, if the full well, election comes, that would be get admitting off fault. Scott Brady. I mean, you're, you want people to in, you want people in a government organization to admit fault. Well, that's, that's a whole. Well, no, fucking Janet Reno admitted yeah. fault to Waco, which meant nothing for her career or for anyone else. Well, if you're the attorney general, your admission of fault is not the same thing as actually finding a sworn federal officer uh, at fault. Yeah, but I mean, it was it was rhetoric, nothing more. Well, of course, that's what, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, actual yeah. consequences. You'd have to challenge the police unions too for there mm. to be actual consequences. Yeah, the Fraternal Order of Police. I do hate them. I think. And that's. I don't hate every police officer. I that's hate something the liberals are going to Sticker for my car. I'm sorry. I hate them because they won't give me a sticker for my car. <laughs> why, why would they? Why would why? they? If you have a fraternal order or a police sticker, you don't get pulled over. That's a, I thought you were going to say that, actually. And that's, um, you know, my mom actually donated $10 to a police organization once because she thought that come the Alex Jones apocalypse of tyranny, like, she'd be safe on a list. And what she got was them calling her all the time to donate more money. And then she accidentally told them that she was against the war on drugs. And she says the guy seemed really dour and unfriendly after that. And they didn't speak again, so there are some bad... <laughs> Sometimes that's not good. <sighs> All right, well, something, something, NWA, next topic. Um, <laughs> we had two options for our final uh, big topic here in our next uh, however long we're going to go here. I think... Perhaps we all know that Mark Ames is a terrible person, and we can all just take a moment to appreciate that. Just nod our heads. I'm kind of in, mm -hmm, bow our heads. No offense, uh, certain religious people who may be present. I think that maybe, even though we've already trashed BuzzFeed a lot, and we did it on that one other podcast, I'm kind of interested in what people have to say about the, the kerfuffle and firing uh, at BuzzFeed for plagiarism. Benny Johnson, the right... Republican, maybe slightly sympathetic to libertarians, at least he spoke at SFL, um, Students for Liberty at one point, has been fired for plagiarism. And insert BuzzFeed joke here because there is an element of humor in someone being fired from BuzzFeed for plagiarism, even though they admittedly have had some longer form essays and reporting that at least is not cat gifts. Um, did you guys follow this, and do you think it warrants a firing? And does it warrant the sort of Twitter schadenfreude that I've seen a bit of? It Maybe doesn't matter if it warrants his firing. He, the, the, the DC media world, Politico, Pointer, Neiman, all of them jumped in, and they, they, they don't like BuzzFeed's business model. So they're looking for an excuse to get somebody out of BuzzFeed. I mean, Ben Smith had to cave when the, when the second blog post came out. Uh, revealing the six other instances, and, I, and in the story or the editor's note that was posted to BuzzFeed either last night or this morning, they they had gone through his work, and I think the total was 41 instances. So, um, you know, it, it was impossible not to fire him. Uh, there's there's an interesting parlor game to be to be played about whether you know t stealing text is the same thing as stealing images, which is what they also do. Right. Uh, I I don't know. I I don't really care. The I think it's it's sad that I, I wish when BuzzFeed hires a, an isolationist or a libertarian, I'll believe that they're uh, I'll be a little bit more favorable to them. But so far, their only two right-leaning people are, um, you know, it's Catherine Miller who was hired from the Free Beacon and Benny Johnson who was a serial intern and plagiarist. Uh, they're and then you know Rosie Gray, uh, who reports on a lot of right-wing people, like just about all of her sources and who she quotes consistently are all neocons and hawks. They, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, they've got some explaining to do. <laughs> Beyond uh, plagiarism in um, the hilariously yeah. titled Red Johnson articles. I'm beginning to think they're against us. <laughs> Quite. I mean, does does all this mean that BuzzFeed politics is more relevant than I thought it was? I don't know. You're certainly trying to make it that way. I can't tell what's relevant because of Twitter. I'm not even in D.C., and I still get the element of, like, really unable to tell what's relevant to the larger world. Because what's relevant to the larger world is actually just one direction or something I, like that. I, I didn't. I barely even knew that there was, like, a news tape, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Well, they, I mean... I think there's potential for the hilarious bullshit content subsidizing 
good content. And in theory, you could do worse. You know, you could have no good in-depth reporting at all. But whether they're really doing good reporting is another matter, I suppose. And I think I just want cat uh, pictures. I mean, I feel like this is a thing that's so. You know, this is Sharknado again. This is a bunch of people on Twitter kind of being all up, you know. This is, oh, it's so big on Twitter. And then you look at the rest of the world, <laughs> literally no one cares. No one who reads, I mean, what's the percentage of people who read BuzzFeed who know Benny Johnson <coughs> is, you know, a kind of conservative writer for them? Or do I mean, they... a lot of people read BuzzFeed. Well, I, think, I think the real reason why this is such an issue is that, is that BuzzFeed, uh, their business model makes a lot of journalists nervous. Mm -hmm. And so when, when they when they can take a shot at them, they will. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the amount of Schadenfreude that I did see on Twitter was, you know, a little outrageous. And yeah, it's it's a shame because actually, I don't know if it's a shame. Well, I mean, BuzzFeed, it's as, as a publication, has helped um, <coughs> has helped me be more peeved at Schadenfreude because I'm so tired of the the Twitter mob. But um. I don't know which BuzzFeed writer it was, but it wasn't uh, Benny Johnson. It was someone else who did the whole woman makes ill-advised, potentially actually not at all racist joke about South Africa that was in the air for 12 hours and then a terrifying mob of people <laughs> decide that she's the worst human on earth. I mean, BuzzFeed has helped with that kind of thing. So if I was more collectivist, I might say that this was some kind of justice, but... I don't think that that was really um, this guy's mo as much as possible. But another question though is is like the ethics thing, um, like like whether journalistic ethics and uh, attribution applies to gift lists. I mean, the dude was the viral poli or right. viral it, content. It was a fast food restaurant in Fort Hood. I mean, they they you're you're talking about absolutely surface level content. Mm -hmm. and plagiarism of basic facts from Wikipedia. This is absolutely the most superficial level of journalism you could possibly do. The, uh, does, that mean, does that mean it doesn't matter that he... Um, I mean, I assume that his work day was totally hectic. I, I, I'm going to safely assume that there was no malicious intent and it was sure. actually someone who failed to change the content that they were, you know, using for their sources. Um, and that's all, because he probably had a hectic life and was constantly, you know, needed to make a new viral thing happen. So, I, th I think it's, it seems a lot more forgivable than, you know, some, you know, um, Stephen Glass or somebody, some sort of dramatic um, fi uh, fictionalizing, uh, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's I guess it's fire worthy, but it also seems sort of... There's a weird line between, you know, like, stealing ideas and intellectual content from, like, Reddit, which is basically what BuzzFeed is. Right, exactly. And, you know, s stealing words. I mean, there's this weird kind of, it's okay to s just take pictures and give, you know, a tiny little link that no one will ever go to back to the original, you know, article or Reddit group that came up with it, but, you know... You know, the words he stole is like Wikipedia like level entry stuff like And Yahoo just, answers. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean like does that really it's sure, cool. okay, you should get fired for that, but <laughs> think about it. It's so inconsequential compared to what you know, BuzzFeed's made their entire, you know, business model and all their money off of, which is taking other people's ideas. Mm. Yeah. Well, don't we think that kind of necessitates them getting rid of him? I mean, if you're if you're standing on that house of cards, you got to throw that guy off just so it it detracts from the fact that it's exactly what you do every single day. <laughs> <laughs> like you can't it, yeah. once it becomes obvious, you got to toss that guy off the ship. <laughs> you know. No, that's that's exactly right. And they just they just implemented their new editorial standards, which which supposedly allow them to go back to old posts, neither ditch them if they don't meet the standards, or correct them, or add anything else. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty skeptical of the way BuzzFeed manipulates the discourse. I mean, the, the, one, thing, it, the one thing that is uh, heartening about, uh, if there's anything heartening about the, the sordid Benny Johnson story, is that you can fi get fired from BuzzFeed for something other than being a hater. And, uh, <laughs> no haters, please. 
the line at the bottom of their, uh, um, you know, uh, request for resumes or whatever is you have to not be a hater. And, and every single one says that because I've looked at them. Every single <laughs> one says that, and it's so irritating. And as as someone who I, I'm sure uh, qualifies as a hater because of my piece about them, uh, you know, that's sort of nice to see. <laughs> no, no haters. This means you, Jordan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. Every once in a while, when I really start to despise Gawker or or BuzzFeed, there's always some you know something where I'm like, oh, that wasn't bad. But there's a lot of bad content and a lot of. The day uh, Gawker hires any remotely libertarian sympathetic person is is going to be the day that I'm actually impressed by any of these people. So you're never going to be impressed. Exactly. <laughs> never. I well. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I lost all my faith in BuzzFeed when they fired uh, Mark Duffy, the coffee ranter guy, after like... Yeah. Oh, the yeah. That was, he was too mean. He was too yeah, mean. Yeah, he was a hater. It's true. Awesome. Yeah. No hater rate at BuzzFeed. Yeah, they're... Uh, they are annoying, aren't they? But I don't know. My true hatred still lies with Salon and Mark Ames. <laughs> And, and uh, the Washington Free Beacon. Except for the one guy who's okay and needs a better job. Should we talk about more games? I'd like to. I'd like to know what you guys think about some things. Uh, what, what, uh, I can't what, resist now that you're asking. Or do we have time? Are we running out of time? Uh... No, he asked so nicely to talk about Mark Ames. How can I say no to him? That's true. Jordan, what are your thoughts on Mark Ames? Tell us. Well, so I, I, obviously, it's just like a tissue of innuendo, but, uh... The, I think what the, is his entire existence, but I mean, be specific for the for the people out there. I'm talking about the two pieces. The first one about uh, reason, supposed um, apartheid apologia, and then the second one, which was about the the Holocaust denialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the the second one, I, I think that's a that's a little bit more dodgy. But uh, for a reason, you mean? has always been a big part of uh, a, a big part of libertarianism. But as far as the like the apartheid um, apologet, uh, apologetics piece goes, I think this is really interesting because Reason immediately disavowed that and, and you know said this is ridiculous. This this journalist wasn't um, you know pro apartheid at all. Um, but it, it speaks to uh, a really interesting sort of strategic historical debate that the right has, and w which is the you know the the basic question: What do you not get to vote on? And uh, when you're talking about the you know the history of colonialism in Africa, are you going to open up the franchise even if it means an end to liberal institutions or um, you know a, a, a diminishing of economic freedom or or something like that? And what you had w among recent writers is a, an awareness of the evils of apartheid and that it was a horrible system, but that whatever whatever might replace it might be worse. And that's the sort of that's the sort of sentiment, that's the sort of caveat that you're not allowed to suggest in today's you know post Nelson Mandela world, and oh, yeah. that's what Mark Ames hung them out to dry for. And and my question for a, for a doctrinaire cosmopolitan libertarian is how do you deal with that? Where do you are, are you allowed to admit the questions of what aren't people allowed to vote on? And, and it seems like reason has studiously avoided those questions. For a pretty long time, the, you, you don't really see them talk about them on their website now, and uh, I, I think there's a and that these things were dredged up by Mark Ames. I think that's sort of good. I, I think you, you need to realize that if you care about economic freedom more than democracy, then the nature of the left is it's going to come for you and it's going to call you evil. Yeah, there's too much nuance. Uh that uh, the nuance you just spoke, um, which I think is is totally legitimate to consider, and you uh, you can't talk about that, much like you can't you know Rand Paul's old civil rights um, questioning disaster, even though he questioned one you know one aspect of the Civil Rights Act, and he was surprisingly nuanced in his initial comments, and the Rachel Maddows of the world you know interview him and put words in his mouth. And it's just not, you shouldn't even talk about certain things because you're not going to get a fair shake. Um, and even careful people, like Paul was in that instance, are not going to get a fair shake when they dare to question this kind of thing because it's such a charged issue. And that's the thing with the, the article, you know, that Ames wrote. He, you know, the reason, I think it was Mark Swainpool or whoever it was, who 
you know, you search on the internet for him, there's nothing about him except for those couple things in reason. But, you know, that's the, the thing. Mark Ames could have actually made, you know, a salient point about, you know, how libertarians, you know, the, the divide, I guess, between talking about, you know, economic freedom and kind of the race thing, especially with South Africa, you know, they were so worried about socialism coming in and kind of just destroying all economic freedom, you know, but Mark Ames doesn't want to talk about that. He wants to say this one little instance where, you know, a libertarian may have actually been being honest about something totally stains, you know, the entire magazine and its history and all the no, the, the entire for, philosophy for literally like a two paragraph thing. You know that is Mark Ames's proof that reason is this evil, horrible place that's racist and you know. Well, I mean, it, in terms of like the apartheid thing, it's a, it's a legitimate concern about you know the much more left people who were who were you know going to take over from this old apartheid system to wonder what that's going to result in as well. But it's, I mean, one shouldn't defend economic freedom for a tiny white minority, you know, obviously, yeah, that, because that's, that's, that's if, you know, there's no way to quantify which one is worse, I suppose, for, you know, but, like, you, you must, you know, you must reject them both because they're both fundamentally not good. Right, and there's no discussion of that, like, actual, you know, Swainpool even admitted that, his, you know, kind of reporting would rankle actual libertarians back in the States. But, you know, that was a, I hate to say, like a different time. <laughs> you know, there wasn't the information out there. There wasn't the kind of debate, I guess, going on. And so, but just the fact that Mark Ames uses that as his definitive proof is just now, in the second well, article... The more interesting question, or the, or the more interesting example uh, of, of, you know... Uh, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult to tell where libertarians should come down on this sort of decolonization question is Rhodesia. Rhodesia, um, it, it didn't have um, racial, um, it didn't have stated racial uh, restrictions on voting. If you own, if you own property, you were allowed to vote, and obviously that that de facto led to uh, you know vastly more white participation than black participation. But um, the idea was as black people became more economically empowered, they would gradually join the political system and also tend to support, uh, you know, more liberal policies. And uh, Rhodesia for a long time was one of the fastest growing places in Africa. It, it was effectively a success story and then it was crushed by, uh, because for one thing, uh, you know, the British Empire wouldn't stick up for it, Kissinger sold it out, uh, and, and so did South Africa. And uh, it, and it was eventually taken over by a Soviet-backed, uh, you know, popular front. And uh, that's sort of, Mark. A that's a story that Mark Ames is completely comfortable with. Mugabe coming to power in Zimbabwe is a just outcome, according to Mark Ames' worldview. And I'm just not so sure that that's the case. Well, he's a bad leader. I mean, <laughs> like, you, you, he, he, he's done bad things for the country just in the sense that he wasn't a white colonialist. I mean, that that is ending the story too early. Um, but, you know, Ames is, Ames is fundamentally not a credible source of anything. Like, the, the second piece he's done most recently about reason, it seemed potentially dodgier. Like, I didn't have the energy to look into the reason archives. The idea that it, it was about um, questioning the Holocaust and also historical revisionism, I guess, reason in the 70s had a entire issue talking about historical revisionism. And historical revisionism gets a bad rap because people act as if it's fun, like inherently means I don't believe in the Holocaust. Revisionism right. can, can, can also mean positive things like was World War II, you know, inevitable and were the Allies you know, sepia-toned heroes, and, you know, it, it, you can be questioning some of the good things, some, questioning some of the basic principles that everybody learns in every history book now. Exactly. Or it could mean some, being of the best, <laughs> some of the best works of libertarian history are revisionist, like the, uh, you know, the myth of a guilty nation, or, uh, you know, what is, what is that, the Thomas Fleming books about FDR. And, uh, I, I don't know, as far as the um, aims in the Holocaust revisionism thing, I, some of the stuff sounded bad, 
uh, you know, the context yeah. that he chose and the quotes he chose. I, I will grant that. Maybe it was a bad idea. <laughs> it was a bad issue. Um, but also, you're looking at somebody, you know, at the exile. Mark Ames was a big fan of Edward Limonov, who is, you know, one of one of the Soviet unions or one of Russia's, you know, top fascists, mm -hmm. uh, you know, founder of the National Bolshevik Party. You know, he's he's very he's a conditional supporter of fascism himself. <laughs> Which is yeah, and that seems a little more less theoretical than even you know an ill-advised reason issue is that he truly was <laughs> supporting this guy, and you know he he, he likes to describe how he like to rape Russian teenagers and wanted them as soon as he found out they were 15. And basically he's an awful person in every way. And we the, should never speak of him again, Jordan. Never. The webs he weaves, like the little tendrils that he connects to like, you know, the image on that piece was the, the, Co the Koch brothers, you know, reading about the Holocaust and how it didn't happen. You know, mm -hmm. as if they, you know, personally... Isn't that part of their ideological platform? Holocaust right. does just, not happen. He's so ridiculous with, the, you know, the quotes that he picks out and the context that he creates for these pieces. I mean, I, we can grant that that may have been a bad issue, like a very bad I issue. Have, I haven't, you know... The New York confirmed. Times had some bad issues. You know? Right, exactly, exactly. In liberalism, you know... He doesn't taint them forever for, you know, having one guy who was wrong about something. Or even a couple. I mean, libertarianism is a fringe belief that, you know, fringe attracts other fringe beliefs, and there have been some unsavory ties that I wish weren't there. But, you know, left ideas and right ideas have caused so much, so much human misery has come out of people who subscribe to these beliefs. And particularly the left gets to be clean. Um, about it, they get to you know they get to feel clean, and libertarianism gets sullied by a handful of people who got too cozy with some bad people. It's like and saying, it's just you know, so convenient. It's like saying slavery existed when you know rook Democrats were in charge, or you know whatever, and then connecting that to the current Democratic Party or the current Republican Party, because somewhere back in time there was you know a wrong idea somewhere. Yeah, I mean it's. Again, Ames, he has no credibility, so it's, we, in so, so many ways we shouldn't talk about him, but he's <laughs> such a conspiracy theorist. He's, he's, a, he's truly a conspiracy theorist in, in terms of the Koch brothers. People that talk about it because he's sort of the, he's the best and most, um, I don't know, he's the, the most well-researched version of, of a lot of, he makes the most well-researched case for a lot of assumptions that people seem to have about libertarianism, and we're all closet fascists or something. And uh, you know, we're we're going to as soon as we take power, we'll we'll instate you know the the Ayn Rand slave state or something. <laughs> yeah, right. and so, so right. I think I think his ideas do bear talking about it and and, and you know deconstructing and, and seeing where they go wrong. He's just so staggeringly dishonest. I mean, at the end of the piece, you know, the, the second piece um, with the revisionism stuff. I was wincing at a couple of the quotes he chose, you know, I was. And at the end, he's, he describes libertarianism as this idea that has been the driving force of the Republican Party for decades, I believe he says. And I was like, what if the fuck are you true. talking about? <clears throat> what was that, Adam? I said, if only that were actually true. I know, exactly. If only that were true. And talk about historical revisionism. <laughs> quite. And the moment you talk about that, I'm like, all right, you have, you have no credibility in anything. He believes libertarianism, you know, he's one of those people that believes it was invented, you know, in a, in a, in a bunker meeting in, you know, 1955. Brothers and whoever else. I, I always wonder, sorry, Lucy. Go on. But, like, so people, well, first there's the air quotes around historical revisionism are quite humorous in that piece, but what does he think that, like, professional historians do? that they just continue to repeat what's already been written. I mean, that's the whole point of being a historian, is revising. And right, right. this idea that historical revision is some kind of evil force or movement, you know, that's dangerous. And it's also dangerous to, when you go back talking about South Africa and if you talk about it's dangerous to not consider these questions. Whether or not those mm -hmm. questions are immoral or, you know, considered to be disgusting, You ha someone has to consider those questions. And, you know... Well, I guess we should all just censor ourselves because it makes people uncomfortable 
to think about these things. Even if even if these things, even if what people are, if people are saying there's no Holocaust and it's complete and utter bullshit, that doesn't mean that someone somewhere shouldn't say that. If only so that other people could be like, no, you know, it is bullshit. There's definitely a Holocaust. Those yeah. people are dead. Mm -hmm. well, somewhere along the line, historical revisionism became like conservatives in Texas, you know, changing textbooks. Right, right, right yeah. True. Yeah, there's the chilling effect with just screaming racism or you know anti-Semitism or sexism at people. You know, that's that's a, a very you know real danger in the world, especially. And I, I think we see that in the United States, especially oh, yeah. about it's, it's all the time with certain libertarian women. It's, well, it's also it's particularly bad among a certain clad, class of like white liberal male journalists, where they're always yelling racist at other white people, and they're always yelling sexist. And sometimes I wonder, and this is it's my armchair psychology, how much of it has to do with their own, you know, discomfort with themselves. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this, this, these pieces are a classic case of a white liberal male journalist crying racism at other white people. And then kind of looking around going, yeah, right, guys? Right, guys? And a lot of people are like, we don't really care about this. You know? Like, I have to, you know, just, they just don't care, but he's like, no. And then the Jewish community is like, dude, really? I mean, there's always those people that are going to be like, that's right, Reason Magazine. But most people are like, this is not what we're interested in right now. You know, we're much more interested in illegal wars in Gaza. So that's just... I don't know. But I really think we may have actually spent too much time on Mr. Ames, no matter how much we hate him. <laughs> A moment is too much. Talking I mean, about him only makes him real. <laughs> I don't even think he is real. I interacted with his flunky on Twitter once and was appalled. It's actually me, Lucy, by the way. <laughs> that would be really upsetting. I am Mark Ames. That would be really upsetting <laughs> for so many reasons. Oh, my God. We were, as usual, we talked for too long, but mm -hmm. unfortunately... It always starts getting good near the end, right when I'm going way we got to get warmed up. We need to like do 40 minutes of just talking and then just put it live... I may try that noticing. Out this time. I may do that. All right, let's wrap it up with a quick, very quick dose of um, what are you enjoying this week that is not related to politics? And my answer is, wow, I don't even know. I started reading this book about World War One that's next to me, but that's sort of politics. All right, someone else go. Joe. Uh, I've been listening to music again for the first time in a long time. <laughs> Really digging some Band of Skulls and Fantagram. I don't so I'm, know what those are entering at all. Hipster, I'm entering my hipster phase. Oh God, <laughs> that was bound to happen, but that's upsetting. Uh, Adam, uh, I'm enjoying uh, Shenandoah National Park this week. Oh, that's good. Uh, nice. Uh, uh, yeah. Can I go next? Okay. Uh, I saw Dive last night. Uh, the band. I'm not really doing a whole lot of non-politics stuff, but I just turned it in a review for uh, the American Interest. A review of a history of pop music that should be uh, forthcoming. Sounds good. Uh, Michelle? <laughs> I've been hate watching the first few episodes of The Leftovers. Don't know mm, if I okay. like it. Uh, don't know what's. I don't know. I, I watched one about... episode and was, I wasn't feeling it, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, Christopher Eccleston, he, was, he played Doctor Who once, um, and he's in it, so that's the only thing that's really kept me watching. I'm like, hey, hopefully he gets better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he plays, a, he plays a crazy priest or something, or reverend, whatever, so I've been hate-watching that and sort of enjoying it. Um, yeah, I honestly don't remember what I am doing. Though so what I have to do after this podcast is sort of non-political, and that I'm going to hang out with a blogger libertarian woman who does the honest courtesan. So that'll be fun. Um, all right. Who wants to promote something? Adam, do you uh, want to promote to the people? Yeah, my, uh, I'm still working on my natural fitness. Uh, you can find it on Instagram at Aspen and Iron. Uh, check out my natural fitness pictures online. Okay, good. Uh, Joe, anything? Uh, I'm building some more websites for people. That's about it. I'm not... My band has a new CD coming out. Someday I'm going to go see your band, Joe. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Joe helped me with an IP issue, or not intellectual property, just like I accidentally assigned the same IP address to two laptops and I'll, over Twitter. I'm like, Joe, help me. And he's about to get Joe. Joe so. so you're promoting Joe's skills right now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so nice. Ask him to build more websites. So. <laughs> Very good. Um, Jordan, what are you working on besides what you just said? 
Uh, blog in, writing, editing, read the Daily Caller, read uh, the Mitch Ray Use, my blog, uh, follow me on Twitter, just the same old. No one can spell your blog name, Jordan. No one. Okay, I'll spell it. Uh, M-I-T-R-A-I-L-L-E-U-S-E. I saw you struggling. I saw you remembering. <laughs> I know. I'll link to it so people will actually... We had it tabbed so we can look at it. <laughs> okay. Um, God only knows how long that went, but it, it, was pretty, it got pretty good. So I hope the audience, our one viewer out there and our future viewers enjoyed it. Um, thank you, Adam. Joe, Michelle, talk more next time because you're good at talking. And Jordan, thank you for joining me. And tune in next time whenever the hell that happens. Bye.